This is a first for Try the Better. Try the Better, for those of you who don't know us, is a nonprofit that facilitates and uh, distributes, disseminates information about so what we call socially purposed enterprises in Toronto. There are many now, um, of which a pretty significant proportion are featured on our website www.torontothebetter.net. Um, it just facilitates people's desire to use enterprises which actually have a social purpose rather than uh, simply a financial purpose. Anyway, I'm really happy today to welcome uh, Kathy Crow. Kathy is an old friend, uh, both in terms of uh, we both lived in the same area of Toronto, east side of uh, Young Street in Toronto, and Kathy has, as I was saying before we started this, uh, I wouldn't say single-handedly, but it's been the main driving force between uh, behind uh, growing recognition of the plight of homelessness, of the uh, situation of homelessness in Toronto and more broadly in, in Canada. With Kathy today is a colleague, Paul Pickman. Uh, Paul has uh, uh, experience in uh, mental health environments and currently works with me, uh, with our group in, uh, in a hospital in Southern Ontario. So that's why Paul is here and uh, Kathy should need no introduction but will no doubt explain uh, the current situation around homelessness in Toronto and beyond. The last thing I want to say because it is a good, um, I think a good segue into where Kathy is coming from, is that although um, it would look like China uh, might have little or nothing to do with what we're doing today, in fact uh, China does, because the most famous non-unknown Canadian of all time is a person who worked in healthcare in China and was actually um, uh, adopted as a friend of China by the revolutionary leader uh, who brought independence to China, that is Mao Zedong, and the name of that person is, uh, I'm wondering who in the audience knows that person, Kathy does because she has a chapter in her book about it, which you were talking about, but does anybody else know? Uh, when I said he's the most famous unknown Canadian, it's true, because most people don't learn about this person, but he was a mega hero of the revolution in China and was known by the 1.6 or 2 billion Chinese people at a certain point in time. Um, this person's name, since I gather that I'm, I don't want to um, uh, keep the suspense going too long, this person's name is Norman Bethune. And Norman Bethune was known at a certain point in time by all Chinese and very few Canadians. And without going into the reasons why Norman Bethune was not known by very Canadian, by too many Canadians, we could say that it might have something to do with his politics. But he brought a westernized healthcare to China and was therefore became a subject of a poem by Mao Zedong at the time of the revolution. Uh, that's enough about China. Uh, now I'd like to hand it over to Kathy, who will be talking about the current state of homelessness and particularly about her new book called An Outside Full of Dreams. Kathy. Thank you. I love that you talked about Norman Bethune. <laughs> um, he was a big influence on me many, many years ago. Um, yeah, so this is my book, An Absack Full of Dreams, um, Memoirs of a Street Nurse. Um, the title refers to my large black knapsack that I wore when I was doing street outreach and nursing clinics and drop-ins and shelters. Um, but it, I stole the line from Tommy Douglas. Uh, Tommy Douglas, widely considered to be the founder of Medicare in Canada. And in a film I watched about him, he was described as having a suitcase full of dreams, um, meaning that he, he dreamt about good roads in the province of Saskatchewan and good schools and good jobs and also good health care, health care for all. So I kind of stole that um, from him. Uh, there's a lot of buttons on, on the cover of my book and they introduce each chapter. They're buttons from many, many years of going to rallies and demonstrations. And the buttons link to um, the content of each chapter. Uh, and as uh, Tim mentioned, every he alluded to each chapter in my book is influ is introduced by a movie that influenced me. And the second chapter, I believe it is, 
is the movie called The Scalpel and the Sword um, that was based on a book about Norman Bethune. Um, there's another chapter introduced by the movie MASH, which and that chapter deals with sexism in nursing. But the link, there's a lot of links between them all because Norman Bethune actually, um, my understanding is invented mobile, yes. uh, mobile, right. mobile, ar I forget the acronym, mobile army, surgical something or other, do you know? It's a, surgical hospital. Uh, surgical hospital and blood transfusions and taking health care, taking health care out to where people were affected, which is also the concept of primary health care, which is also really the model that street nursing, etc., was based on taking health care out, literally two drop-ins in shelters where people were homeless and, and then as homelessness got worsened, taking it out to you know, whatever was happening, whether it was Tent City down on the waterfront or a squat under a bridge, etc. So my, my book, um, I wrote it during a period of unemployment a few years ago when um, it was, it's really felt that I was blacklisted actually for my advocacy. Organizations wouldn't hire me so I had time and I still felt I had something to contribute and I was getting this, you know, sharp reactions from young students that I was meeting all the time. For example, I would say to them, well, I, I nursed during the Cold War, you know, and they would kind of nearly fall over because they didn't really know what I was talking about. And I and, uh, would describe the role that nurses should play in fighting militarization, for example, and how the economy was increasing funding to military expenditures and, and then canceling housing spending. So. Anyway, their reaction really is what made me write the book, and uh, the first, I would say the first half of the book covers um, areas before I became a street nurse, so it, it looks at privatization and healthcare, it looks at a whole campaign that was instrumental in fighting the return of the death penalty in Canada, there's a whole other chapter on, that's about fighting apartheid, and then about chapter 10 onwards, it's really describing the the dramatic growth of homelessness in the country that about 20 years ago we actually declared to be a national disaster. And I honestly am kind of in shock now because, you know, I've just come from this event at City Hall where um, a new group called the Shelter and Housing Justice Network is trying to convince Mayor Tory to use the emergency legislation at the city to declare homelessness an emergency so that we can enact solutions and we have a petition to that effect and if you go to Mayor Tory declare homelessness an emergency on change.org if you google something to that effect you can come to the petition and uh, we love your signature. Can I ask you something? Yeah. Yeah. Um, at the time that you were starting uh, your nursing I was at uh, I think I was at uh, Eva's place. Oh, okay. Uh, that right. just opened. Sure. I was a manager there. And then I scooped down to uh, Maximilian Center mm -hmm. uh, there. Um, so, and you had started the street health at that point. Um, what's been the highlights and lowlights for you looking at where you are now sure. with respect to the progress or not? Yeah. Um, so, like on a personal level, going to street health was one of the best things that ever happened to me because it freed me up to do the kind of nursing that I think I was meant to do around advocacy. So, just personally, that was good. Um, so we've had we've had many many wins over the years. Um, some wins that are gone, so they're not visible to see. So, for example. Um, over the years, and you would remember it because you were there, but I mean, we had we, we had a number of empty hospitals, for example, unfortunately closed because of the Mike Harris government in Ontario, but we had some of those empty hospitals turned into emergency shelters over the years. One was the old Princess Margaret site on Sherburne, another was um, the old um, Central Hospital on Sherburne, Doctors Hospital as well and a nursing resident. So there were times when protests, like mass protests, hundreds of people going to City Hall, you know, really did force City Hall and the government to respond. And so we saw, I think, lives saved through, through measures like that. Um, the, the biggest highlight, and I come to it at the, at the very last chapter in my book, um, 
was certainly in 1998, which is a long time ago, but it was when the Toronto Disaster Relief Committee formed and we had a press conference and we launched what was called the State of Emergency Declaration, calling homelessness a national disaster. And what happened with that was it, it jumped across the country. Um, Jack Layton took it to Winnipeg to the big city mayor's caucus and because it was a problem not just in Toronto, it was a problem in all the big cities and smaller cities. And it meant that different city councils passed resolutions saying that it was a disaster. That's like really a radical thing for them to do. But what all that did was it created a momentum across the country so that the federal government was essentially forced to launch a brand new federal program on homelessness. They had different acronyms, right? Initially it was yeah, Skippy and then it was HPI. I'm really curious about your thinking and your values. Has it stayed the course throughout all this or has it evolved differently now than it was before? My values? Yeah, your values, your thinking about homelessness. What, what has been the evolution, transitions? Where have you come at this point to understand mm -hmm. that was different from mm -hmm. then? Um, I think, I think one one challenge that I'm still struggling with is how do you how do you involve the voice of people affected by the issue? How do you involve homeless and low income people um, at the table in a way that's equitable, like really fair? That's, I think I've learned over the years, like that's a stronger value I have now than in the beginning. You know, especially as a nurse, you're trained to think that the professionals know it all and blah blah blah. Um, and, and you know, the group that really, really does that well is OCAP, Ontario Coalition Against Poverty. Our, our group, TDRC, Toronto Disaster Relief Committee, was very hierarchical. Um, we were not a poor people's movement, but we also didn't pretend to be. And I think right now, we have a one-year-old shelter and housing justice network, and it's a real mix right now with a lot of a lot of struggles around how to how to do it right. So I, you know, I was having conversations uh, the other day um, and talking about um, the voices, um, the marginalized, the homeless, or many different marginalized folks, as you know. Yeah. And, and you mentioned the word structure. Mm -hmm. You know, the hierarchical. Mm -hmm. You know, the kind of structures yeah. that you you are hiding that. Um, but I'm curious to know. How do you think the difference between um, uh, people, uh, other voices um, that are able to move systems, that are mm -hmm. citizens-based, and whether or not there's a difference uh, between them and, um, and the voices of the homeless in the march? Because sometimes those voices, like the Indigenous First Nations, mm -hmm. have a loud voice. Mm -hmm. I remember back in that time, the mm -hmm. Black Action Defense Committee mm -hmm. had a loud voice mm -hmm. and was mobilizing police mm -hmm. and racial issues and card, you know, the versions of carding and things like that. Is, is there any similarities and differences in terms of that movement? Like, is this, did it, like in terms of holding uh, the structures to account with mm -hmm. the, the systems and stuff? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll be frank, we're in a horrible state uh, of activism, of any kind of activism right now. Um, um, the union movement is not apparently, in, is not is not visible in, on this issue. Um, uh, you just have to look at what happened this morning. There was a very strong indigenous voice at today's event, and I'm happy about that. There were no union flags at the event, this rally. Um, there were even hardly any people from the drop-in sector or the shelter sector there. Um, there was no strong presence of faith groups there today. Um, we are at a very low point when it comes to activism on this issue. Um, for a lot of reasons. <laughs> um, so it's very challenging. Is it a disappointing challenge or is it a challenge that, you're, that you think um, should be uh, 
re-energized? Well, it's a deadly challenge. It has to be re-energized. I think there's a lot of social movements in this position right now. And I think, you know, we go, my friend uh, Barrett German describes how we go through highs and lows periodically. And we're at a low point right now, um, which is quite dangerous because we're also pre-recession. And uh, it's very hard to make visible what is actually happening out there. But we're trying to lay it out there. So, so there are ma there are major roadblocks, right? The union movement has its own issues in terms of membership and what they can do, and in terms of their leadership and their challenges. Um, donations to not not for profit or advocacy groups are diminished. There are massive struggles with the media in terms of getting attention to issues or getting good investigative. Um, reports done on issues. Um, these general issues around social justice are rarely taught in school. So you've got a whole wave of activists from the 70s, 80s, 90s that are either retired now or ill or have passed away. Um, you know, Don, Don Heaps, for example. Um, so you, you lose, you've lost, you're losing that experience. You're losing that mentorship. Um, there are young environmental activists, for sure. That movement is up and coming and growing. But we have a lot of challenges. Um, so I've, I've often wondered, and I use this analogy in a conversation I was having. Um, you know, at Sherman and Bloor at the Maps and Means Center, I, you know, um, <coughs> Uh, they had the Manpower Center down the road. So people would get up in the morning, some would go to the Manpower Center and line up. <coughs> and then there was these unknown folks that knew that if you stood by the corner of Sherbert and Queen, yeah. people with trucks will come by yeah. and mm -hmm. load people up if they wanted to and take them away. For temp work, yeah. And I was, at that time, I was the director of a PSU primary support unit. So I got that going uh, for the 10 beds. Uh, sta crisis stabilization for men who are homeless men who are psychiatric issues. And one of the curious things there is watching um, folks jump on um, and mm -hmm. then those who uh, have been uh, homeless walking by and coming in and say, I don't have money. You know, they walk by the same truck, mm -hmm. but yet they would come in to the shelter mm -hmm. and say, where's my check? And I often wonder, and I'm looking for your analysis on this, what, what is it that allows them to pass by where money is available if you work for a day, mm -hmm. and others do, versus mm -hmm. those who don't? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just curious about that. Well, I mean, I, I, so this was a, a common location where temp agencies would come by and pick people up for work, and we saw many of them in our nursing clinics at Street Health injured the very next day or a few days later. We saw street-involved youth that were doing asbestos removal through those jobs. And, you know, I'm sure you can imagine how complicated asbestos removal is, and there surely would not have been proper safeguards. We saw uh, older men having to lift the, the huge um, barrels, barrels is probably not the correct word, of, of beer, you know, the big metal and whatever. Cakes. Cakes, thank you, cakes of beer. You're not a patron. <coughs> I am actually. <laughs> um, I don't drink cakes. Um, so we would see them with back injuries um, in the days when f people used to do flyers through the same agency. Uh, and when pesticides were still used, we would see um, chemical reactions on people's feet and ankles from walking across the lawns and being exposed. So um, we should never be in a position where the economy and low welfare rates are forcing people to to have to take these kinds of jobs. And you know, there are pay beds, there were yeah. pay beds at that shelter too, yeah, which pe right. always really surprises people. <laughs> when they hear that, yeah. they suddenly they think better of people that are homeless. Oh, they, they're they working and they pay for their bed as if they're a different class of yeah. well, people you know, who's homeless. You know one of the surprising things where I used to do um, St. Michael's Hospital will send psychiatric residents and we would give them a tour. They There's a third world center right in Maxwell Mean Center, like at Seat in the House, for example. And they would come in and you could see them shrink around mm -hmm. 
<coughs> as they were mm -hmm. walking into the atrium. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because there's over 300 odd beds at the mm -hmm. Salvation Army with mm -hmm. different step up kind of yeah. internal housing. Mm -hmm. And um, and they would be frightened. They, they did not believe that you, you could be right around the corner yeah. in third world condition. And I think that attitude is still the norm in healthcare. But I will say that there is an entirely new group of young physicians and nurses and others that are part of Health Providers Against Poverty and also the Inner City Health Associates in Toronto that want to do this work and they respect people they're caring for and have a totally different approach. And Gary Block is, is one at St. Mike's who has actually developed um, kind of a, a social audit, if you will, uh, and, and way of assessing when people come in is there something that's missing in their income level that his his co-workers can help the person with? Are they eligible for the special diet allowance? Are they eligible actually to be on ODSP? And maybe the person was resisting going on disability because of the stigma, but is there a way that you can work with that person to fill out the forms properly and get them on? So there's quite a, quite a dramatic shift. There never used to be nurses that wanted to be street nurses, and now there's like a lineup of people that want the job so that's like impressive, I think. I um, I was wondering if 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 you know much about those kind of informal kind of things taking place in the city, and if if they're growing or not. I'm out of the loop at this point. So. Yeah. So I th <clears throat> I think there always have been um, small networks. Of, uh, I'm mostly, I don't know about the houses, although Sanctuary, uh, an agency in Toronto, has one or two houses where people live communally, I believe, like that. Um, and I think it's a mixture of like people that are with work for Sanctuary and that use Sanctuary, so it's kind of interesting. Um, and certainly I've seen it in the past in squats, in empty buildings. Um, and I think the most visible expression of that is happening across the country now, right now with tent communities. <clears throat> so in, you know, in Kingston there's a known tent encampment in a certain area. In Toronto, same thing. The people in the Don Valley have always known each other, for example. Um, um, big warehouse squad out in Star Grove. Is there? Yeah, don't say the location. Yeah, yeah, I know they got shut yeah, down. Yeah. I used to be part of this organization called the Robin Hood Collective. Oh, and that's... we used to go open up squats and do uh, squatting yeah. workshops for yeah. people to give people the skills to, yeah. to like keep warm, you know, figure out ways of going to the washroom, figure out ways of paying food. And, so, and, and so for the listeners for this in the future, just to let you know, this is the first year ever that agencies, frontline workers, are actually calling for donations of tarps and tents. So we've always called for, all of the agencies have always needed socks and sleeping bags and blankets, but now they're calling for tarps and tents. And people and agencies are not publicly saying who they are because they're not allowed to, right? If they get any city funding, so this happened under uh, David Miller. Um, I should maybe just ex cover a few historical things. So when David Miller was the mayor, around that period of time, uh, an American policy called Housing First was imported into Canada. And that's now policy across the country. One expression of it is that you don't support people living outside. You don't give survival supplies. So that means that if any agency gets city grant money, they are not allowed to give sleeping bags, blankets, or hot food. So agencies are having to do this under the radar. That's why I'm not going to name where you can donate your things. But if you have things to donate, find me on my website. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm curious about what prompted that initial question. What, what was it you wanted to get at that was important enough for you to put that out here? Uh, what, what is it that um, you want just, to know? Well, um, like to kind of support that network, I put together this uh, organization called the uh, Organization of Autonomous Community Spaces and stuff to kind of like organize it and stuff. It didn't really go anywhere. Can I ask you uh, and, and Kathy, um, I'm curious about your, your encounters with mental health and homelessness. 
in the what's been in, space in, 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 yeah in, in that's institutional spaces like hospitals or in community settings or in street nursing what what has been uh, the, the pros or the, the highlights or benefits of the system or what are the drawbacks that you have constantly encountered or people that you've known just just to put that up for uh, like in terms of like what could be offered Sur through service the or houses. how people are saying about did I get help what was lacking I have something to say about that um, when I lived in the shelter I noticed that although people got fed there wasn't much focus on their nutrition and I think this contributed a lot to people's like stress people would oftentimes be like getting on each other's nerves and creating fights yeah. and things. <coughs> I think that'd be an important thing to focus yeah. on is people's nutritional requirements and helping them to build up their bodies so that they can cope with stress yeah. again. So, you know, I think it's not normal to to throw a lot of people to live together in the same room. Yeah, um, that's really true. And the Salvation Army, Maxwell Meehan, and some of the other shelters are the, the better option compared to what's happening now, right? So we now have what's called, we have, now we have a whole second tier, a lower quality type of shelter in the city called respite sites. Are you familiar with uh, the new development of the well, respite sites? Well, I think the only respite site that back when was the Gerstein Center was it? No, it just started service. two years ago. Oh, two years ago, ago. but that, they were the year. first kind of generation of so-called respite. Well, that was a mental health site. crisis yeah, center. So yeah. the respite sites are the new language for describing emergency shelters. So they're large, three of them are large domes that they look like soccer domes. Yeah, and a couple of other are different lo in different locations. Last year at the CNE, there were 200 people in, um, I think it was the Queen Elizabeth building. And we actually did secret, we did secret footage of that, secret video footage of it after we complained about the conditions and the city wouldn't do anything. So it's not normal to to crowd people together like that. So that affects their diabetes, it affects their mental health, it affects yeah. everything. Um, so the, the I, I just have to name the problem with your question though, which is that housing first, which is national policy, and if you watch the news in the next few weeks, you'll see this. Housing First believes in housing people with mental illness and addictions and prioritizing it. So we do not really have a national housing program or a provincial housing program or a city housing program that is housing for families, housing for children, housing for people that have cancer, housing for people with disabilities. It's focusing on removing the visible unwanted from the street. We don't have a national psychiatric crisis. Oh my gosh. We don't have a national strategy yeah, of psychiatry. We don't have those kind of things. Right. Uh, there's a lot I mean, of things there's, we don't have There's a lot of yeah. things there, that there are indeed, um, as uh, both, uh, both Paul and Kathy and uh, I guess has indicated, a number of kind of non-governmental responses yeah. to various problems. Um, all I would say is this, and uh, you know, I'm going to be a little bit devil, not devil's advocate, a devil, right? So I'm mm -hmm. going to say that none of these, frankly, are going to make a significant difference to the problem. The problem is structural. The problem is that uh, our current economic system actually requires a certain number of people who don't uh, fit in, put it like that. They marginalize a whole variety of people. Are there options out there? that, you know, if only they were better organized, it would in fact address the problems that Kathy is only too aware of, which is homelessness, right? So could we stitch together a network of independent actors who, like uh, your collective house and others, Habitat for Humanity, would in fact make a, a difference to the overall problem? Well, the thing is, would you do that for Medicare? I mean, to be devil's advocate to the yes. devil, would you do that for Medicare, that you would want to stitch together volunteers and community groups that, you know, maybe I could go to you because, you know, you're good at uh, liver disease, or I could go to, you know, you for, uh, to help pay for my hospitalization for a few days. So that's not, that's not the approach we're taking. We're taking the approach that Canada 
has a wealth of experience in building housing, building supportive housing, social housing, co-op housing, public housing, you name it all. And until we go back to that, that program was canceled in 1993, we will be doing, dealing with band-aids. We'll be talking about how wonderful tiny homes are. We'll be talking about how wonderful it is that um, student groups and architects are designing little boxes the size of these two tables that homeless people can sleep in outside, but they're on wheels so that they can move them to another area. Or we'll be talking about, um, you know, um, like what I call low-hanging fruit. Simple little kind of sexy ideas that are not going to house, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people that are homeless. We have to put energy into bringing back a social program, and it's called housing. But what you will see, you will see three levels of government over the next few months only talking about funding mental health. You'll hear that, and that might sound good to you, and it's not that we don't need it, but we're not going to see lots of housing being built. So let me, let me just, because the one thing about the homelessness and, and the housing, you can see that people are dehoused. Mm -hmm. There's these word. encampments, um, yeah. tent cities, but there are, even though it's invisible, it's still visible, it's still structural, mm -hmm. you can touch it, you can do that. But there's the invisible, within the mental health. This is what a patient told me the other day. They wrote it out, it wasn't, I didn't think about this, but this is what makes it visible because psychiatry and mental health doesn't honor this information because they don't know what to do with it, but it's common across board in my over 25 years in the field. She says, she's a female, 63. Um, she struggles since childhood with mental health issues. She says, um, that she's had over 10 hospitalizations. She says that she's attempted suicide over 10 times. It's common, but it's not visible. It doesn't get reported. Just like suicides don't get reported in the media, and the people are not paying attention to it. She says, people that are on the psychiatric ward, which she is, often say that they feel like they are invisible, mm -hmm. or that they should never have come into existence at all or nobody even cares whether or not they are on the planet Earth. In essence, what they're really saying is that no one cares about them. They want to be loved. They want to know that, hey, somebody really does care and understand them. They are all here for a reason. They must have suffered some kind of abuse of some sort. Coping mechanisms are different for different people. Some smoke, some drink, some become drug addicts. They are all self-medicating for some reason. Mm. All of us need a hug or a kiss. Every now and then, we need to know that we matter. We are relevant. We can be of some use to someone, somewhere. There is a way of giving back to society if we are to really serious, be serious about it. There are some people that are just plain lazy and I do not want to work at all and do not want to work or they do not want to help. I get that. For me personally, I am repaying the government of Canada in my own way and helping others in this process. I was taken aback because she wanted to say, Paul, can I write down something for you? I said, sure, whatever it is. It's really important about visibility. I don't feel visible. So I, how, how does the system in psychiatry take this information that's given and, and, and give it due, a due process, due mm -hmm. accord? How well, does that happen? Because that's so similar to what you've probably experienced across the board. Please give this lady feedback of how articulate she is. That was really lovely. Uh, I, well, I've, personally, I'll just say I've never seen the medical system, in particular psychiatry, do very much that's very helpful on social issues. I mean, I don't look to psychiatry, actually, to be the, the advocate's voice on very much. So I don't know what to say. I, I, I really like the advocacy groups that support 
consumer survivors and people that have been in the system. This woman should have supportive housing, right? I mean, we're, I don't know what her housing situation is, but somebody in this situation, especially who's hospitalized, should not have to wait eight to 10 years for safe, and safe is an operative word, um, affordable housing. Um, but that should, again, be uh, my point really is just to say that should be the right of everybody. You know, Premier Ford is going, is likely, very likely not going to be making improvements in the healthcare system. And there's one organization called the Ontario Health Coalition that has a lot of information on their website. So if, if listeners want to, you know, follow what's happening and have a voice to try to protect what we have and improve what we have, that's a really good organization. 